I'm going to ask you to join me in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 27. Uh, We are almost at the end of this great story of God sending his people with his message uh, to the ends of the earth, and we join Paul on a journey uh, towards Rome, and he's on a ship, and that ship is in trouble, and so we find him and his shipmates in a storm, and I'm going to read uh, several selections from this chapter and the beginning of chapter 28, Uh, but before I read, I'm going to ask you to join me in this prayer as we approach God's word together. Open my eyes and I shall see, incline my heart and I shall desire, order my steps and I shall walk in the ways of your commandments. Open my eyes, and I shall see. Incline my heart, and I shall desire. Order my steps, and I shall walk in the ways of your commandments. Acts 27, beginning in verse 19. Hear now the word of the Lord. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart For there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. And then join me in verse 33. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having, having taken nothing, nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it. And began to eat. Then they all were encouraged and ate some food. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. And after the ship crashes, then join me in chapter 28, verse 1. After we were brought safely through, we learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live." He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their mind and said that he was a god. Let's pray. Father, would you help us now as we come to the great story that you have told us in your word? And the great story that we read about 
in these chapters of your keeping and protecting your servant. We pray that you would help us to understand what we have read, that you would, by your spirit, open our hearts and our minds, not only to the truth of what we find here, but to the powerful work of your spirit. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this past fall, my oldest son broke his arm playing soccer. And as some of you know, it is no fun to see your kid go down hurt. It is no fun to walk out onto the field and see his arm bent in unnatural ways. And so to be honest, as I ran out on the field, I was kind of freaking out. Uh, but in that moment of panic, a woman walked up beside me. It was the mom of one of JJ's teammates. She walked up beside me and she said, I'm a doctor. I'm a pediatrician. How can I help? And when I heard those words, my anxiety level dropped significantly. Just her calm presence and expertise changed the situation for me. And I thought about her and that experience as I read about Paul in Acts chapter 27. Paul finds himself in what should be a panic-inducing situation. If ever there is a time to freak out, it is when you are at sea in the middle of a storm and the ship is falling apart around you. But that's not what Paul does. Paul doesn't freak out. To the benefit of everyone around him, Paul remains calm and hopeful even when all hope had been lost. Even when there was every reason to be afraid. And in doing this, though Paul does not present the content of the gospel in this passage, he embodies the truth and the power and the beauty of the message about Jesus in the way that he acts, in the way that he talks. He embodies the peace of Jesus and his kingdom. And in that way, he is a model for us. I don't think I have to work very hard to help you see how this text is relevant for us. We find ourselves in a stormy situation culturally, and for many of us personally as well. And hasn't it at times seemed like the ship is falling apart around us? over the past few weeks. And so the question becomes, how can we, like Paul, embody the peace of Jesus and his kingdom in this chaotic situation? How can we be a peaceful witness in our chaotic painful moment? That's the question I want to ask of this passage this morning, and we will look here, and we will find two ways to do that. We can be a peaceful witness when we resist self-protection and when we embrace divine vindication. So first of all, we need to resist self-protection. Fear is inherently self-focused. When we are under threat, when the ship is falling apart around us, our natural instincts, our first response is, how do I protect myself? How do I survive this situation? But Paul acts against that instinct. His persistent focus throughout this crisis is on the well-being of the people around him. And remember who these people are. These are his captors and his jailers. 
These are the soldiers who wanted to kill him because they were afraid he would escape and they would be punished for it. These are the sailors who refused to listen to his advice and put everyone in this dangerous situation to begin with. In other words, as Paul focuses on the well-being of those around him, he is following Jesus' call not only to love our neighbors, but to love even our enemies. And I love the concrete form that Paul's concern takes. He becomes the grandma of this sinking ship. He's like your grandma who's always trying to force food on people. Everyone around Paul is in despair. They are saying, we're all going to die. But what is Paul saying? He's saying, eat, eat, eat. You've gotten too skinny. You need your strength. Eat something. And so the prisoner on this ship becomes a host. And he presides over a meal that in verse 35 and 36 sounds remarkably like Jesus presiding over over a meal, as he gives to his disciples and us the Lord's Supper, the meal of communion. Now this meal is not that specific meal, but Luke, our storyteller, echoes that language because he wants us to see the profound extent to which Paul is acting for the good of his neighbors and even his enemies. Are we a presence like that? Are we a presence like that in our homes, in our communities, when the ship starts falling apart? When we find ourselves in turmoil or danger Do we resist the instinct towards self-preservation so that we can pursue the profound good of the people around us? Now that applies in a number of different directions, but I want to connect it specifically to the ongoing racial crisis in our country. Acknowledging that I can't hit every nuance to this issue, and I can't say everything that could be said. But early last week, Micah Edmondson, who is an African-American Presbyterian pastor in our tradition, he posted a picture of what his seven-year-old had drawn during their church's online worship service. And it was the picture of two stick figures, a man and a woman, both of them with words coming out of their mouth. And both this stick figure man and woman were screaming, I can't breathe. And then Pastor Edmondson asked us, what did your children draw during the worship service? My six-year-old didn't draw that. Because my six-year-old doesn't live under the same weight, the same threat, the same suspicion, the same prejudice as young black boys and girls do. And that difference should break our hearts, should make us angry should be unacceptable to us. That difference should lead us to turn away from our instinct towards self-preservation and turn us towards the suffering of our neighbors of color. And I want to quickly mention five ways that we can do that. First of all, we can listen and learn. We need to educate ourselves on the past and present of this evil in our culture. 
And there are so many resources available to you to do that. Steve linked to a few in this week's news, email newsletter. And let me also mention a few others. Christianity Today published a sermon and then an extended interview with Esau Macaulay, who is a professor at Wheaton. I found what he had to say very helpful. Uh, Steve linked to the book, Heal Us, Emmanuel, and a chapter in that book by a pastor named Russ Whitfield is available for free online, and Russ, along with Duke Kwan and Erwin Erwin Entz, are all pastors as a part of a church planting network in Washington, D.C., and they are saying things and they're doing things that are important for us to pay attention to. I mentioned Micah Edmondson and his wife, Christina, both good voices to listen to. Our denominational website has reports and statements from our General Assembly about the problem of race in the church. And I could go on and on and on. The point is that there are resources available to you, even in our tiny corner of the Christian world. We need to take the time and energy to hear, to really hear the suffering of our neighbors of color. And then from our listening and learning, we need to grieve. We need to weep with those who weep. We need to lament, remembering that biblical lament includes anger at injustice. And then from our grieving, we need to repent. We need to examine our hearts and lives. We need to ask, how have we as individuals, as as communities, how have we participated in the failure to dignify, to humanize those made in God's image? And then from our repenting, we need to pray. We need to beg God to bring his reconciling kingdom and to overcome the demonic power of racial superiority that has had our nation in its grip for so long. And then from our praying, we need to ask a question. We need to wrestle with a question. How can we, in our homes, in our communities, in our spheres of influence, how can we speak and act and invest in the long, difficult process of change? Not an easy question, but it's one we must wrestle with because in the storm, when the ship is falling apart, we must turn from our self regard, our self-preservation, and we must become hosts, giving ourselves and our resources for the nourishment and the lives of others, our neighbors and even our enemies. But to be honest, that's extraordinarily difficult to do. I would say it is nearly impossible. So we need to ask, how do we do it? How can we be this kind of presence in our community? And the possibility of doing that comes not only from resisting our self-protection, but from embracing divine vindication. In the ancient world, storms were signs of divine judgment. That was true in the Greek and Roman imagination, and it was true in the Jewish imagination as well. Think Noah. The story of the flood is the paradigmatic story of a storm as the judgment of God. Remember also the story of Jonah. God says to Jonah, I want you to take my word to the people of Nineveh. Jonah says, nope, and he goes the other way, and he boards a ship heading to Tarshish. And then what does God do? God interrupts his running with a storm. He brings a storm of judgment to interrupt the running and rebellion of Jonah and to accomplish his will. 
And so with that background, anyone observing what was happening to Paul would have thought, he's a really big, bad guy, and he is getting what he deserved. He is getting divine judgment because he has done something really, really bad. That's what the inhabitants of Malta thought. Uh, They thought the goddess Justice was after Paul, and although he may have escaped her storm, another sign of judgment, a venomous snake, think Genesis 3, attached itself to Paul's hand. And so the inhabitants of Malta thought, now the goddess Justice has him. She is going to judge him. She's going to punish him for what he has done. But of course, Paul does Taylor Swift. He shakes off the snake and nothing bad happens to him. He goes on serving his neighbors by helping to prepare the fire. Why? Because there's something else going on here. Because the true God of justice is telling a different story. The true God of justice is telling the story of a transformed Jonah. See, before his conversion, Paul would have shared Jonah's racist distaste at the thought of any other people, any other nation, any other ethnicity, hearing about and experiencing the kindness, goodness, mercy of God. He would have hated that idea. But when he met Jesus, everything changed. And his life was consumed with the mission of bringing the word about God's goodness and mercy and kindness coming to the Gentiles, to the nations. And that's why Paul is on this ship. That's why he is in the middle of this storm. He is on his way to Rome with the gospel. And he says in the letter to the Romans that he's not only on his way to Rome, but he wants to go beyond Rome to Spain. Which, interestingly, is home to the city of Tarshish. You see, Paul wanted to go to Tarshish like Jonah did. But Paul was going, not running away from God, but running with God. Running with God's heart to show his kindness to the nations. And so the symbolism of this storm changes. This storm isn't God punishing Paul It is God preserving Paul, preserving his messenger so that his message can go to the ends of the earth. And that is why Paul can remain so calm when the ship is falling apart around him. He says it in verse 23, his inner peace comes from the God to whom he belongs. Paul knows that even though he is in chains, in reality he is free. He knows that even though he's treated like a slave, in reality he is the beloved son of God. He knows that even though it looks like he's being rejected, judged, punished, In reality, he has been welcomed, accepted, loved, vindicated as God's servant, as God's messenger, as God's witness. And that calming assurance, which holds Paul in the middle of this storm, that Calming assurance belongs to us. It is ours. 
not because we share the specific vocation of Paul, but because we have received the message of Paul. That calming assurance is ours because we have heard the message that Jesus, the one who was powerful enough to hush the storm, chose to enter the storm, to suffer the storm of wrath and judgment on our behalf so that we could be accepted, loved, welcomed, and vindicated. Not because of our innocence, but because of his righteousness. That calming assurance is ours because we've heard the message about Jesus who through his life, death, and resurrection has begun to crush the head of the serpent and will soon crush the head of Satan underneath our feet. Romans 16, verse 20. That calming assurance is ours because we have heard the message that as G- after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, he poured out his spirit into our hearts who says to us, even now, Abba, Father. He reminds us of the God to whom we belong. And that is where you will find calm in the storm. Not in your competency to respond to the crisis, but in the God to whom you belong through Jesus. And that is where you will find the ability to turn from yourself toward your hurting neighbor. Not many of us have done a lot of air travel lately, but I imagine most of us still remember the safety talk. You remember it, don't you? In the case of an emergency, when the oxygen masks fall from the ceiling, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to put on your own mask first and then help others put on their masks. That is not selfishness. That is not self-centeredness. That is putting on the ability to help others. The message about the God to whom we belong, the message about Jesus, who he is, what he has done, what he has given, the message about our welcome, our acceptance, our our being loved, our being vindicated in him, that is our oxygen mask. That is the air we must breathe if we're going to help other people catch their breath. Because see, So often the reason we can't hear the cries of suffering around us is that we're so busy trying to shout down the cry of worthlessness, of shame and guilt within us. But when the vindicating voice of Jesus quiets our hearts, then we can hear and respond. You can be a peaceful witness in this chaotic moment because the God of peace gave himself in order to give you a peace that is beyond understanding. And he has become your fortress. He has become your dwelling place. Jesus walked on to the field of our panic. And he says to us even now, I am with you. Let's pray. Father, we call out to you, our helper. We are in the middle of a storm. Our country, our city, many of us personally, some of our families, it seems like things are falling apart around us. And you've given us this calling 
to represent your peace, to represent your goodness, your mercy, to be a source of life to the people around us. And we are not sufficient for that calling. So we ask that you would come near, that you would come and by your spirit remind us of the God to whom we belong. Remind us that we have nothing to prove because of Jesus and everything to give. Enable us to be your faithful witnesses as we entrust ourselves to the one who gave himself for us. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.